In the Age of Ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded in fog and ruled over by everlasting dragons, but even now forces beyond the ken of the Undying Serpents worked their influence. Soon the Lord Souls would be uncovered, and Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, who challenged the dragons, ushered in the Age of Fire. But as with all living things, the fire would eventually begin dying, and Gwyn would sacrifice himself to allow it to burn but a little longer. There were other forces though that threatened the reign of fire, and a power that had once ruled over the world wished only to return it to its ancient state. Gods had begun. Humanity had all players deep and challenging. Different is less likely to get me horribly m Before the ancients, there was little of a world to speak of, one which all of nothing is known. Then came a creeping mist, a scourge of grey, and a will that dominated the land. Up from the bare rock grew the arch trees that reached high into the sky and dominated the newly born world. Soon the everlasting dragons would come and dwell among the trees, inheriting the land from the one of eternity itself. For eons unknowable creatures watched the unformed world, but its unchanging nature was of little interest to their vast intellects. The all-encompassing rule of the everlasting dragons had made them complacent and tedious to the watchers, but there was something else of interest among the mists of the primordial land. Dwelling among the towering arch trees, there were the original giants, simple and primitive under the subjugation of the dragons, but given a spark they could become so much more. And then it came. Disparity. The uncoupling of heat and cold, life and death, light and dark, the first flame. Within the flame, the giants found three powerful souls, one for he who would give himself to death, one for her who would know intimately the flame, and one for the Lord of Lords, he who would lead a war against the undying dragons. But there was another. Deep beneath the crags of the grey world, the stunted kin of the giants would find their own soul amongst the embers of the usurped fire. The pygmy would share the soul among their own kind, the hollow, soulless beings. But unlike the other lord souls that dwindled with continued use, this one only grew stronger every time it was shared. Out of the darkness the holders of the soul grew, becoming what would become known as humanity, but eventually they would be called back to the abyssal place of their birth for no holder of the Dark Soul could ever resist their destiny. After his defeat of the Everlasting Dragons, Lord Gwyn built his kingdom atop the ashes of the unformed lands, and from atop an Orlando, his seat of power, he watched his subjects flourish. Soon though, his Age of Fire would begin to wane. Far beneath Gwyn's shining throne, the Witches of Great Isolith attempted to weave a new flame for the Lord of Sunlight from their own soul, but manipulation of the flame was beyond even the Great Lords themselves, and the city was overtaken by it, warping the Sisters of Isolith into Daughters of Chaos, and spawning terrible demons to ravage the once great place. Dispatching his Silver Knights to stem the demon's rampage, even Gwyn's best soldiers were overrun by the Flame of Chaos, pushed back the armor charred black forevermore. Seeing the fading flame as an opportunity, shadowy beings allowed the darkness to begin creeping from the abyss, to reconnect with any bearer of the dark soul and wash away all else. The abyss would first emerge in the town of Ulysses, where a primordial serpent of the dark stalkers tricked the townsfolk into seeking the abyss. With the connection made and the abyss consuming Ulysses, there was only one way to stop it to destroy its source, the father of the abyss, the primordial human, Manus. Driven wild by the uncontrolled humanity of the abyss, Manus cared for little else than retrieving a pendant that he had lost when he was truly human. Using his great power, he snatched people from throughout all of coming history, including Gwyn's successor and a mysterious man clad in all black garb, possibly more at home wielding more complex and innovative trick weaponry than mere swords and shields. A hero would eventually put Manus to rest and stem the spread of the Abyss, but Ulysil would still fall, being consumed by nature, leaving the Abyss waiting for its next chance to cover the world in darkness. The flame almost gone and his options few, Gwyn chose to sacrifice himself to the flame, burning his own soul to keep the Age of Fire alive. The dark was persistent though, and despite his attempts to control the spread of humanity by binding them to his flame with the accursed dark sign, the flame would one day fade once more. During Gwyn's rule though, the unknowable intellects had taken a renewed interest in the world, now full of life. 
but there was one who looked upon the disparity and deemed it unacceptable. In the second age of fire, many great and powerful kingdoms rose, but the entity that had first covered the ancient land with grey mist and arch trees desired only to return the world to its state of stagnation. It unleashed terrible demons to tear the kingdoms apart, and breathed its grey mist across what was left. This scourge was only halted when those who would become the monumentals, powerful prophets, pulled their knowledge of a great form of magic, the soul arts, to lull the terrible old one to slumber. By this time though, over half of all humanity had been exterminated, and the land now lay in ruins. To repair the damage, a concerted effort was made to repopulate four lands, each connected by archstones, points of instantaneous travel, so that aid was never far away if calamity were ever to befall them again. Unfortunately, it would, and all because of the desires of one. Deep below the Nexus, a place where lost souls attempted to find themselves once more, in a realm much like that of the everlasting dragons, dwelled the Old One, promising riches and power to any who pledged themselves to it. Fearing for the prosperity of his own kingdom, King Alant of Boletaria chose to join with the Eternal Beast. But rather than riches, all that befell his kingdom was despair and destruction, for his actions had awoken the Old One to begin its scourge anew. Many heroes were beckoned to end the threat, but most were felled or overcome by the temptation the beast offered. The second scourge was only stopped when the Slayer of Demons fought through the waves of terrible monsters to the grey lands below, ending the tyranny of the Twisted King and returning the Old One back to slumber. Even as the grey mist retreated though, all is not well, for again the flame begins to fade and one must be ready to take the place of Lord Gwyn, link the flame and preserve the Age of Fire. Across the great kingdoms, still recovering from the second scourge, a new plague emerges, one where the dead perpetually reanimate, each time losing more and more of themselves to uncontrollable aggression and madness. With it comes a mark burnt into the flesh of the afflicted, the dark sign. Those with the mark would be rounded up and thrown into asylums in an effort to stop the spread of the curse but it was to no avail. Little was it known that the Dark Sign had been a contingency plan put in place by Lord Gwyn in the event the flame would fade again, a control over humanity even long after his reign, to perpetuate the Age of Fire lest they suffer the consequences. With the plague of undeath still spreading, people grew desperate and looked at age-old legends that spoke of Lordran, the land of lords, where a chosen undead would gather the souls taken from the first flame and link the fire, putting an end to the undead curse and bringing the world into a new, prosperous age. Few believed the tale, but some would take it to heart and set out to free the undead from their asylums. One of these people was Oscar of Astora, who would free the chosen undead before meeting his fate at the hands of the terrible demon guarding the asylum. Upon travelling to Lordran, undead must ring the bells of awakening to discover their purpose in the land of lords, and upon doing so will find the truth from the primordial serpent, of the link of fire and Gwyn's great sacrifice. Retrieving the Lord Vessel from the illusion of Gwyn's long absent daughter in Anor Orlando, and filling it with the remains of the original Lord Souls that it desired, the Chosen Undead proves himself worthy to succeed Gwyn and puts the Old Lord to rest before linking the flame, allowing it to burn their own soul's fuel. For an age, prosperous kingdoms would rise up, but as the flame began to fade yet again, there would always need to be an undead who would prove themselves and link the fire to maintain civilization. This would occur uncountable times, with kingdom after kingdom rising and falling on top of each other. This was, to an extent, also true in the great land once known as Lordran. But with its state inexorably tied to the continued linking of flame, the very earth would change, becoming twisted as the flame inevitably became weaker. Over the millennia, the strength of man had continued to grow, and the abyss had attempted to rise over and over, most notably consuming the city of New Londo and taking control of a portion of a lord's soul. But it would be in the lands of Dranlaic where the abyss would rise once more and attempt to smother the flame once and for all. When man as father of the abyss had been defeated so long ago, his soul had been lost to him. But being the bearer of the original dark soul, it was not destroyed, and rather shattered into many fragments. Most are thought to have become simple humanity sprites, but some were destined for much greater things and reconstituted ages later into four beings, four daughters of the Abyss. All were born from a place desiring to spread the darkness, but all ended up finding their own ways as part of Manus Reborn. Ilana became an avatar of vengeance, embodying his wrath. 
Nadalia seemed to become his remorse and desire for penance. Alsana was his love and loyalty for what he had lost and the bearer of the broken pendant. And Nassandra fully embodied his deviousness, treachery, and desire to extinguish the flame, allowing the abyss to consume all. Nassandra remembered the giants of old, Gwyn and his ilk, and their use of the flame to banish the dark. Despite their difference to the giant lords, she desired to prevent any potential interference with her plans and seduced Vendrick, king of Dranlaic, coercing him into waging war against this age's giants and stealing a powerful artifact from them. After sustaining a counter-attack for many generations, the giants were rooted back to their homeland, but Dranlaic was left in ruins. As if this wasn't enough, the undead curse had returned, marking the fading of the flame. Refusing to allow the cycle of linking to continue, Vendrix worked to cure the curse of the undead, but soon came to realise that Nassandra was working towards her own goals. In the time since Lords, the kiln of the first flame had become the seat of power, the throne of want, and one sacrifice to the throne elevated them to the state of a lord. Of course, Nassandra's goal was to smother the flame and usher in the Age of Dark, ready for the abyss. Vendrick would not allow this, however, and placed roadblocks to stop her ascending the throne. It is now that an undead traveller ventures to Dranlaic to seek a rumoured cure to the undead curse, and Nassandra sees her opportunity to remove the obstacles in her way. Forgetting their past and coming to believe that linking the flame is their true purpose, the cursed undead seeks to obtain four great souls to prove their worth, as many, many lords before them had. Only there are other threats on the horizon, for Dranlaic and the Abyss alike. Deep below what may have once been the site of Anna Orlando, still remains the ancient Chaos Flame, still lingering from the Witches of Isolith's attempt to clone the First Flame, which threatens to engulf the world in demonic fire. Venturing to Elium Lois, frozen to contain the Chaos, the Cursed Undead meets with Alsana, birthed from the darkness of Manus' soul, but loyal to a king, a hero who contained the Chaos for as long as he could, giving his life in the process. Rallying the king's finest warriors, the cursed undead descends to the old chaos, and atop what little possibly remains of Isolith, the chaos is pushed back again and locked away behind a wall of ice. With the threat of the old chaos quelled, the cursed undead is guided by Nassandra, queen of Dranlaic, in a human form, to dismantle the obstacles to the throne, only for her to reveal her true self once the path is clear, and attempt to usurp the throne and fulfil Manus' greatest desire. Only her pawn has grown much too powerful and manages to defeat her. At last, climbing atop the throne, the cursed undead is ready to fulfil their destiny and keep the flame lit, if just for a little longer. A day would eventually come though, when the flame would die and no one was there to kindle it. On this day, the twisted lands would collapse in on themselves and the darkness would engulf the world. But even in dark, embers may still live, and given enough time, light may return to the land, but illuminate a world like no one had ever seen before. With each link, the flame grew dimmer, burned shorter, and the world becomes more twisted. Over the ages, hundreds of powerful beings are given to the first flame, with the majority not surviving, or driven mad by the experience as Gwyn himself was. Some extremely powerful or determined beings, however, not only survived, but retained enough sanity to return to the world, a part of the first flame still burning inside them. In time, the quest of a chosen undead to prove themselves able to link the flame was lost, and attempts were made to create the perfect being to link the flame, and remain alive to be a Lord of Cinder if it needed to be linked again. But the attempt ultimately failed, producing a frail and crippled child who would not survive the linking alone. He became known as Prince Lothric. After the experiment that was Lothric, there was no longer any time, for the fire would soon fade. And when the bells tolled, it was decided all Lords of Cinder must be awoken and return to Link the Flame, including Lothric, for only together did they possess enough power to achieve the Link. The Lords betrayed their thrones though, with only Ludlith of Coraland, the weakest but most mentally robust of the Lords willing to sacrifice himself. The Abyss Watchers, descendants in duty of the Great Abyss Walker, who had supposedly defeated Manus and drove the Abyss from Ulasil, having fused their souls together into one after Link of the Flame, refused to give up their vigil of the dark below. Yorm the Giant returned home, unwilling to leave his seat of power again, and Aldridge never desired to Link of the Flame in the first place, rather seeing visions of a future beyond life and dark, one of the deep and desired only to consume the gods he saw lived therein. 
with the thrones of lords standing unfilled, the bells soon awoke those who had linked but were ultimately consumed entirely by the flame as a last ditch effort. The end was close though, the flame dim, barely able to alight those linking it, and even the keeper of Firelink Shrine, watcher over the lords of Cinder would come to understand the futility of it all. She came to see things that she was never meant to, that prolonging the flame twists the world into a corrupt mess, and that the coming dark may very well be the natural state of existence. No lords, no flame, only darkness and humanity. Even the chaos-filled bastard flame of old Isolith now dimmed, the race of creatures it had spawned slowly dying in the ruins of their old kingdom. But driven to fulfil a destiny they had achieved long ago, an unkindled known only as Ashen One would successfully make it past Firelink Guardian Gundir, and be tasked with retrieving the souls of the Lords of Cinder, so they may be used as fuel for the flame. The Ashen One travelled the Twisted Lands, even to Anor Orlando, now atop the city of Irifil, possibly recreated by the old god-obsessed Aldridge, wearing the face of Dark Sun Gwyndolin. Once the Ashen One returned, and travelled to the twisted kiln at the end of the age, they managed to find a way to the Ring City, an ancient land bequeathed to the Pygmy Kings by Lord Gwyn himself. Here the Ashen One learnt the truth of man, and the disparity between light and dark. Thus it was decided that the Lord's souls would not be burnt, and upon putting to rest the amalgamation of every soul that had ever linked the flame, the Firekeeper with her new knowledge took the first flame, and allowed it to die in her hands. After uncountable ages and inconceivable lengths of time, the Age of Fire had at last ended, and humans would throw off the dark sign, living once more in their natural state. But something still remained. Embers flitted across the darkness, and soon mankind would capture the remnants of flame and keep them for themselves. The Age of Dark had come, and in it creatures of unknowable intellect stirred, taking a renewed interest in the affairs of man. The abyss consumed the land, spreading the dark soul evenly, and bestowed every human with all the humanity they could ever desire. Unlike their forebears though, the humanity did not go wild. Without the countering effects of the first flame, humanity was able to grow naturally, and a balance was eventually struck. In the darkness, humanity found a great interest in their own being. While looking inwards though, they became aware of what was outside of their own perception. The great beings outside of normal reality had always been present. One had even interfered with the world, leading to the Age of Ancients and Everlasting Dragons. But only now did they become known. In honour of their great ones, a Sumerian civilization dug out great labyrinths as resting places for their gods, and it is here that they learnt the Eldritch truth. Through contact with these great ones, the civilization was elevated and granted powerful abilities, including the manipulation of what remained of the first flame. The civilization captured the embers, nurtured them, and created a tamed flame, allowing light to return to the world. Although no longer bound to it, humanity still sought the fire, but unlike the bonfires of old, they created lanterns, a symbol in themselves of the newfound mastership of the flame. New cities of man rose on the sites of the old lord's kingdoms. Technology spread quickly, and the people basked in the presence of their gods. Quickly, the Age of Dark was turning into the Age of Great Ones, a future Aldridge so long ago had seen. With the growing civilization on monarch rose, desiring to lead the people closer to the Great Ones. To do this, Queen Yarnum consorted with the Great One Odin, and as they were unable to bear their own offspring, Yarnum was blessed with a child of the Eternal the child Murga, but the blessing soon turned out to be a curse, for the other Great Ones grew angry at this fraternisation, and deemed that the child would never be born, forcing it and Yarnum's soul into an endless nightmare, polluting her now lifeless physical remains. The Queen's body was buried in the labyrinth, the chalice dungeons, her subjects deeming that she had carried a Great One, and as such could be considered kin. Without their leader and cut off from their angry gods, the Thumerian civilization fell, and the Age of Dark continued. But as always, change would come. Centuries of dark passed, and the dungeons where the Thumerian queen dwelt were all but forgotten. But when prospecting for a new town, an entrance was uncovered, but interloping in the ancient dungeons also prompted communion with a great one, Aretas, daughter of the cosmos, who spurred the quest for the Eldritch truth lost long ago. A school dedicated to expanding the perception of man was established at Bergamworth, and the new town was named Yarnum in honour of the old Sumerian queen. 
Finding that the old queen had carried a child of the Great One, the Bergenworth scholars experimented with her preserved blood to expand their own perception. Naming it the Old Blood, it was found to have powerful healing properties, and soon an establishment grew up around the blood healing, called the Healing Church. In time, the city of Yarnum became a metropolis based on the practice, but there were severe side effects that had been kept from the public, causing a rift in Bergenworth. People who had received blood treatment were becoming ravenous beasts, but the prosperity of Yarnum depended on the blood. Rather than stopping the blood ministration, it was decided that periodic hunts would be carried out to purge the beasts. Gurnum, the first hunter, created powerful weapons and techniques to fight their foes, but the concept of death was still a problem. Who would hunt beasts if the hunters were dead? Using the insight blood ministration had given them, he communed with the Great One, a presence that dwelt in the haze of the moon, and with it he conceived of the hunter's dream, a realm not unlike the nightmare frontier, where consciousness could be stored upon death, to be reborn into the waking world to continue the hunt. But the problem of the scourge only grew worse, and it got to the point where the original district of Yarnum had to be sealed off and burnt to the ground. Still, the blood ministration continued in an effort to elevate humanity to the level of the Great Ones. But all that happened was that the scourge of beasts continued to grow worse and the hunts became longer until it resulted in an unending night of hunting that may lead to the ultimate destruction of Yarnum. Blinded by their own aspirations, the Healing Church and Bergenworth did not consider the cause of the scourge that lay in the eternal nightmare. Queen Yarnum, still carrying the celestially conceived Murgo, still tormented by its unborn cries, still perpetuating the curse of the Old Blood. One hunter, though, would uncover the truth, gain insight to comprehend what dwelt beyond the veil of reality, and do what no one else would. By travelling to the Nightmare Frontier itself, they were able to slay the Great One that watched over Murgo, and finally put Yarnum to rest purifying the blood and putting an end to the beast scourge. As there always was though, there was more to the hunt than meets the eye. Murgo was not the only child the Great Ones conceived. Upon the beach of a small fishing hamlet lies the corpse of Kos, a fallen Great One bearing a surrogate child. Long ago hunters had done away with Kos, but had failed to dispatch the orphan. But Kos is not merely any Great One. Even if it was done without awareness, Cos was worshipped long ago by the cleric Aldrich and his deacons who received visions of Cos's realm, the Deep Sea. They saw a future where the dregs of humanity would sink to the lowest depths of Cos's ocean and breed abhorrent life, resulting in something much darker than the dark soul of man. Rather than consort with a single human like Odin had with Yarnum, Cos had laid with all of the humanity that sunk to her depths, and had been overcome with the power of the resultant orphan. Nevertheless, the hunter slays the terrible creature, and prevents the coming of the Age of Deep Sea. With that, there was only one thing left to do, end the hunter's dream, so that the hunt may truly be over. German, though, long trapped in the dream and now coerced by the moon presence, would not allow this. The Great One desired of a dream and the hunt to continue. Maybe it fed from the hunters passing through the dream. Maybe it gained a perverse pleasure from watching the hunt. But when German was slain, it descended to make this bold hunter the new custodian of the dream. But the hunter had become too powerful, verging on the insight of the Great One themselves, and defeated the moon presence, gaining unfathomable knowledge and attaining what those Bergenworth scholars had so long desired. They had been elevated and reborn as an infant Great One. Through the whole history of time, the world had been watched by the Great Ones, and from unknowing hollows, humanity had advanced itself to attempt to match these creatures, without even necessarily knowing of their existence. And now one human takes the step to become more than they ever were, to transcend the Age of Dark, and like the Thumerians had attempted long ago, commence the Age of the Great Ones. In the end, whether this is the true evolution of humanity is to be seen, but as was shown with the Age of Fire, no matter how you try to stave it off, the next age will eventually come. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, then please consider liking the video, subscribing and sharing it with your friends. If you want to support the channel even more, then head over to Patreon, become a channel member or buy some merch. Links are all down in the description. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you next time.